Okay, good afternoon, everybody. And you are very, very welcome here to the Institute for Irish and European Affairs. And we are, this is the penultimate uh, lecture in the Development Matters series of lectures that is sponsored by Irish Aid. And it is also the 50th anniversary of Irish Aid. And Irish Aid was established as a prerequisite to our joining the EEC. So it's, uh, you know, I think it's a particularly nice to be marking this occasion with this lecture today by Dr. Lawrence Haddad, who is a world-renowned expert in the area of nutrition. So um, before, we, uh, before I invite Dr. Haddad to uh, start the lecture, just a couple of little housekeeping things. Um, we will have a question and answer session. It will be recorded. Um, there are people joining us online, so there may be questions and answers coming in from people who are online. Um, I would ask if you're asking a question to raise your hand and we will bring a microphone to you. We do need you to use the microphone for the benefit of people who are online. And I'd ask you to uh, tell us your name and your affiliation uh, before you ask your question. Um, if anybody is tweeting or using social media, can you tag at A-I-E-E? -E? Or sorry, I-I-E. <laughs> I-I-E-A, sorry. <laughs> um, and let me just, have I forgotten anything that I needed to, that's pretty much the housekeeping rules. And I would like first to invite Michael Gaffey, who is the Director General of Irish Aid, to say a few words of welcome. Thanks, Michael. Thank you very much. Thank you, Monica. Monica reminded me uh, when we came in that the last time we met was under a tree in Dodoma, where I think it was probably a little warmer than it is uh, here today. So you're all very welcome, and especially, Lawrence, you are welcome to, to Dublin. Um, uh, I must say we are we I, I've, I've come to a lot of these lectures recently and I have to say this development matters series of lectures that we sponsor uh, with the IIEA is um, is more than valuable. It's really essential. And I think the, the, the series of lectures we've had had this year is nearly the most I think it's the most successful of the ones that I've uh, seen over 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 many years. I think it really is a great collaboration and we've had really great speakers and we're bringing the year to an end with two fantastic speakers. First, Lawrence Haddad and then uh, Mike Ryan on the uh, 9th of um, December. So it's two people very, very passionate about about their work uh, for development. Um, so it is it is really great to to see you all here. I, I look, Lawrence. It would take a long time to uh, introduce Lawrence, uh, but he really is one of the most passionate uh, experts and proponents uh, on, on of nutrition. Um, and we have a very uh, long-standing uh, relationship with him. Uh, I would just say that in 2018, he was made a World Food Prize laureate. And in 2022, he was made a companion of the Order of St. Michael and St. George uh, in, recogni in recognition of his services to international nutrition, food and agriculture. Um, actually, we don't have an honour system here. We don't have a monarchy. Uh, we maybe, there have been arguments in the past we should have an honour system. If we had, I think we would undoubtedly be recognising you uh, too, Lawrence. Uh, but for the moment, we, uh, we recognise the, 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 the great British honour that you have received. So GAIN is a long-standing uh, partner of Ireland in our work to address hunger and malnutrition, which is and remains a strong priority for in, in, in our uh, international development policy and in our work. And under this partnership, Ireland is investing in a programme uh, entitled Nourishing Food Pathways, which aims to improve nutrition and prevent malnutrition for millions of people in an environmentally sustainable way. Uh, and we're working closely with GAIN also uh, on, on climate action. And we met in Dubai last year. Uh, we wish our colleagues in, in, in Baku well in these closing days of, of, of a difficult and, and, and challenging uh, COP. Um, but the year ahead, the, the, I suppose the, the, the few years ahead 
are important opportunities for us in promoting the nutrition agenda. They're also challenging because uh, the state of the world is such that often humanitarian crisis and climate crisis have taken attention away from our long-term long development work. And yet, as we were saying earlier uh, to each other, that nutrition is about everything. It's about those crises, but it's also about our long-term long -term development. And next year, the uh, Nutrition for Growth Summit, to be hosted by France in March 2025, is an important moment which Ireland will it intends to step up to. And it calls for sustained political and financial investment in nutrition and to anchor nutrition at the heart of the sustainable development agenda through coordinated action across sectors and across political processes. That's the language of it. But I would, I, I really would emphasize that as a very important moment for us uh, next year as we prepare for other important moments, not least Ireland's presidency of uh, the European Union in the second half of 2026, when I think, well, we haven't set out our development priorities yet, you can take it that the nutrition agenda will be very much to the fore there. And in preparing for all of this and working on nutrition in a difficult uh, environment, uh, people like Lawrence Haddad are absolutely critical to our engagement and to our thinking. And so we look forward to continuing to engage with you, Lawrence, but above all now, we look forward to, uh, to hearing from you here at the IIEA. Thank you very much and you're very welcome. Thanks, Michael. So I think Lawrence is very well known to a lot of people here in development cooperation circles. And, uh, you know, he is the director, the executive director of the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition, uh, the co-founder of Standing Together for Nutrition, which was a response to the COVID crisis and as one of the drivers behind the initiative on climate and nutrition. Prior to his appointment to GAIN, he was the lead author of the Global Nutrition Report, Director of the Institute for Development Studies and Director of Food Consumption and Nutrition Division at IFPRI. He's a development economist by background. And I think that, you know, we're, we're very privileged to have you here today. I think having these conversations around nutrition, uh, which is at the heart of what development is about, is really, really important. So thank you, Lawrence. Uh, well, thank you for such a gracious introduction, both of you. Thank you, Michael. Um, and uh, thank you to the IIEA for hosting this session. And uh, thank you all for coming. Thanks to everyone online. And Michael, congratulations on the 50th. Um, not you personally, or I, 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 maybe, I don't know, but uh, to, to Irish Aid, congratulations. It's great. And thank you. I must say a big thank you to Irish Aid for... Um, uh, backing, um, backing nutrition, backing gain, but backing nutrition. Thank you. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about promoting nutrition in a time of scarcity. And uh, my not very subtle uh, subtext is we need to get out of our comfort zones in the in the nutrition space. I'm uh, I'm going to talk a bit of, very quickly about the context. We we kind of know what the context is. Food insecurity and malnutrition in various forms are, are rising. Uh, money's too tight, uh, but we need to face up to it. Uh, those of you of a certain age will know what I'm talking about when I say money's too tight, money's too tight to mention. Um, by doing so, we'll be forced to be more innov innovative. I, I think we in the nutrition community, this is our time to be really innovative. And not having any uh, lots of new money is not great, but the silver lining is we have to make the existing money work much harder for nutrition. And I'm gonna give you some examples from uh, the IFIs, from the climate sector and from the private sector of ways in which we can do that. Um, not, not because it's not because they're helping nutrition because they're feeling good about themselves and they're giving us charity because it'll help them achieve their goals better. So the context, you know, you've seen these numbers before. This is from the SOFIA report um, 2024, uh, hung, the absolute hunger numbers are pretty much where they were about 20 years ago. Of course, the proportion is lower now uh, because the population's bigger than it was 20 years ago, but the absolute numbers are pretty much 
where they were uh, 20 years ago, around about 700 and, what does that say, 750 million. Um, the number of people in sub-Saharan Africa who cannot afford a healthy diet, and a healthy diet is the, is the ultimate metric that gain, all of GAIN's work is around, improving access to healthy diets for everyone, especially the most vulnerable. Um, and you see these numbers are really quite alarming, and they're going up very quickly. Uh, the number of people who cannot afford a healthy diet, that's just in sub-Saharan Africa from the SOFI report. Those are in millions. Um, and ODA is under pressure. Um, these are from the OECD DAC, uh, and you can see on the left-hand side the percent of ODA uh, official development assistance going to the least developed countries. That percentage is going down. Uh, and if you look at the top right, uh, the, the panel on the right, you can see that the uh, top 15 recipients of ODA, Ukraine is way at the top there, with a light blue part of that bar being the growth since 2022, and it's not surprising. So ODA is really under pressure from Ukraine and, and, and the, the war in Ukraine and many other things. Uh, if you take out COVID, Ukraine and refugees, the OD ODA is in the dark blue and it's pretty much static. Uh, I don't think that's in real terms. So in real terms, it's going down. So ODA is, it's, we're in a tough situation. And I think these, these dark blue nut bars are probably going to go down as we go through 23, 24 and 25. So we're really in a, in a tough situation. And I think here uh, we need to get out of our comfort zone. This is where we're comfortable is the green circle. The panic circle is the red circle and the magic zone is somewhere in between. This is a very scientific diagram, you can see. Um, so first thing I think we need to do is engage with the international finance institutions, the IFIs. This is a real uh, word uh, sort of uh, acronym salad here. Those of you who don't know uh, what the IFIs are, this is an example of each of them. So the World Bank is obviously a, a global multi-development um, uh, bank. Um, ADB is an example of a regional development bank. <clears throat> EFAD is an example of an international uh, development fund, DFI. And then FMO from the Netherlands is an example of a national uh, development finance institution. So there are lots of these different types of IFIs. Um, and they generally deal in concessional finance. And you can see the trend, again, this is, this is from UNCTAD. You can see the trends in, and we don't really have the 23 trends uh, data yet, and let alone the 24. But you can, it's, it's hard to generalize from one year of data, but I expect the, the ODA loans to go up and the grants to keep going down. Those of you who are more experts and closer to this, I'd be interested in your, your views on this. But people we talk to tell us that concessional loans are going up and uh, grants are going down. The IFIs are under lots of pressure to show greater development impact. These are just three initiatives that have been published in the last year or two that basically say IFIs need to do more for development. They need to be more development focused, they need to be more risk taking, and they need to be much faster and more nimble. This is a, a common reframe. So they are under pressure to do this. So we're not, we're not exactly pushing at an open door, but it's not a door that's, that's locked either. There's, there's, the hinges may be a bit rusty, but with the right effort, we can open them. So what, why, are we, why do we think DFIs have a big potential role to play? Well, they're, they're active in areas that are heavily affected by malnutrition. Their financial bandwidth to address the shortfall, they have, they have the money. They can, if, if they so choose, and if governments that they serve um, require them to, they have the, the bandwidth. They are already investing in nutrition adjacent sectors. A lot of them are investing in agri-food agri systems, but typically for commercial foods that are exported to places like Ireland and, and, and the UK. Uh, and they have, uh, I think the positive nutrition outcomes can contribute to achieving DFI's mandates and SDGs. We were at FMO in the Netherlands a couple of weeks ago, and they said, "Where Steve, remind me what SDGs they were keyed into. I think it was education, gender, and climate, was it? Equality, that's right, equality, uh, climate, and gender. And so they, you know, they have this upfront, uh, FMO, the Dutch 
DFI, these are the SDGs we want to achieve. Nutrition is, is very well linked to all of those SDGs that they mentioned. But they don't have explicit nutrition mandates. So we, we actually did an analysis of, of the DFIs as part of the Nourishing Food Pathways program that Michael mentioned. And we did an analysis of them, and uh, each, each dot is, is one of them on this graph. And we looked at their total assets, which is the vertical axis. We, looked, we did an estimate of their level of activity in food systems. It's not, not nutrition, particularly nutrition sensitive, but in food systems. And we, um, we classified them into three groups, the laggards, the supporters, and the leaders. And then we um, interviewed the, the, the letters next to the dots are the ones we actually went and interviewed. So we interviewed a group of the, we should probably have interviewed some of the laggards actually, but we interviewed the leaders and supporters. And the, the things they told us um, from the IFIs, the, the ones we, inter we uh, I think it's the ones at the bottom we interviewed. Um, we, they said nutrition not perceived as a core impact. Uh, it's just a marginal subject in the overall strategy. This is what they told us. Uh, nutrition enterprises are not seen. So these are smaller, medium enterprises. Uh, they're producing, supplying, processing, distributing nutritious food for domestic consumption. They're not seen as an investable market opportunity. Where is the pipeline? Uh, are they investor ready? Um, they tend to look for bigger players. Gain has established a nutritious finance, a nutritious food finance facility, which is a, impact, a blended finance impact fund for SMEs uh, uh, producing nutritious, supplying nutritious foods. Uh, it's a credit facility, and the typical loan sizes are half a million to three million dollars, and we've made six or seven uh, loans already. But the DFIs will say we're not really interested in anything below 10 million. So that, that's a bit of a problem. And then there's, there's a sense that it's nutrition is really complicated. And of course, those of you, I'm not a nutritionist, but those of you who, know, who are nutrition scientists will know that uh, it's a very, it is a very complicated project. That's one of the things that drew us to it in the first place. Uh, it's, a, it's a real blend of biology, chemistry, and a whole range of things. Uh, and, and cultures. And um, so not really a definition of nutritious or standardized metrics. We don't have any, we don't have an expert on nutrition. So, you know, a lot of this is kind of, um, it's a bit of a chicken and egg situation here. Is it governments, do they need to demand more of the DFIs or do the DFIs need to be um, bigger leaders in this space? Probably both. But I think, I think the, the, the good thing about all of these things is they're, they're all, they're all addressable. Uh, and we are we are actively addressing them through advocacy, through capacity building, through um, making pipeline more available for simplifying nutrition. We're working with IFAD. We just signed an MOU at Gain with the Asian Development Bank at Baku. I think it was two days ago. Um, we're working with the African Development Bank. Um, we're working with some of the um, uh, country level F uh, DFIs, Propaco, FMO others at uh, KFW, uh, the, it, it's fixable. This is, fi this, is, this is fixable, but it's not easy because again, we have like, we have three finance experts again. So we have to develop alliances with other finance experts to engage with the, with the DFIs and the IFIs. Um, one of the things we're hoping to do at Nutrition for Growth, and we are going to do it, is a high level panel of experts focusing on the link between nutrition financing, DFIs, and, and other IFIs as well, and supporting them to make first-time N4G commitments. And if anyone's got questions on that, Steve is more current on Steve Godfrey, our Director of Policy, has been working on that issue. But we're very much hoping that the, you know, the IFIs will be making commitments at N4G, not necessarily financial commitments at this stage, but commitments to make commitments, perhaps. So that's, that's the DFIs, IFIs space. The second area is untapped is climate nutrition. And uh, these, this is uh, the initiative on climate action and nutrition, ICANN. Um, Irish Aid is one of the key supporters of ICANN, thank you. Um, but before, before um, Ireland stepped in with support, we produced this baseline report, this blue report, which is looking at opportunities for integrating climate and nutrition. 
So a lot of a lot of papers saying if you do this, you can advance climate nutrition. But there was no report that said where where are the opportunities to do that? Where is the political space? Where's the strategy space? Where's the financial space? So this baseline report tries to do that. Why are we focusing on climate? Because climate finance to developing countries is rising. Uh, this is, again, data from OECD, and it breaks it down by bilateral, multilateral, and private. Um, and, you know, nutrition and climate are very well linked. Nutrition has the nutrition actions have the have the potential to well they do affect climate outcomes so we know what we eat affects greenhouse gas emissions um, we know that diets that tend to be uh, lower in animal source foods especially beef tend to be lower in, in ghg emissions we know that most more diverse diets is you know we more diverse diets tend to be drawn from more diverse local production systems and more diverse local production systems tend to be better for resilience to all kinds of shocks including climate shocks and we know that if we focus on food loss we will be reducing not just food loss but nutrient loss because the most perishable foods tend to be the ones that are highest in uh, nutrient nutrient dense density uh, think of think of fish think of vegetables think of fruits uh, and then, but they're also, if you prevent food loss, you're preventing nutrition, nutrient loss, but you're also preventing wasted climate emission loss, right? Yeah, so you don't have these zombie emissions that you're producing, but then, but no one's benefiting from them uh, on the nutrition front, at least. And then we know climate is affecting nutrition. If you're in nutrition, you know all about this. Uh, yields are going to be affected. It's going to lower not just yields of cereals, but yields of foods that are dense in, in nutrients. It's going to, high CO2 re results in lower micronutrient density and stable foods. Uh, seasonality is all over the place because of climate change. And in too many parts of the world, birth weight, which is the first indicator really of, of stunting and wasting, is, is surprisingly still linked to the month in which you were born, no matter, even if you control for education and income and all that sort of stuff, the month you're born in really matters for your birth weight. High temperatures are having a big impact on stunting. We don't know the mechanisms yet, but there's more and more studies showing this. Excessive heat is reducing stunting, again, controlling for income, location, job, and uh, education and all that sort of stuff. And then high temperatures, uh, uh, extreme rainfall uh, is, is playing havoc with the safety of food as well. And safe, if food is unsafe, uh, E. coli has a, a massive impact on very young children's mortality rates. So what's the potential to exploit those, those links? Um, well, here's a, the, the, so the report, this baseline report, this blue report I showed you, it goes through 13 different areas. It goes through policy areas, strategy areas, and finance areas. I don't have time to present all 13 to you, but I'm presenting a, a, a selection of them. What we did was we looked at how integrated climate and, and nutrition are in each of those areas. And we assigned uh, a level. Level one is no integration. Level four is really good integration by meaning there's a plan uh, for what you're going to do. And there's a, there's a plan to fund it as well. There's a commitment to fund the plan. And um, level two and level three are in between those two extremes. So for example, looking at the, on the left, we went through 166 countries, NDCs, the nationally De determined contributions. These are the uh, roadmaps to lowering emissions for each country. And we said, how much, how many of them uh, have anything to do with nutrition and how, uh, a good plan for nutrition, level four, and how many have no, no mention of nutrition at all? So 60% of them say, don't say anything about nutritious foods. And 2% of them have uh, some, some kind of good, good plan with some commitment to fund it. Now that's either bad news or good news, depending on how you look at it. Bad news is it's not very integrated. The good news is the potential for integration is very high. The right-hand the right -hand side panel is the national adaptation plans. These tend to be uh, not countries like Ireland and the UK, but countries that are much more affected by climate. And uh, there are only, but we could only find 43 of those um, NAPs. And here, here you get a much more balanced picture because 
most of the adaptation has to happen in the food and agriculture space because the food and agriculture space is a big part of the economies of those kind of countries. But even there, there's, there's the potential to do, to get much, many more of the, of the 43 uh, NAPs, the plans into that level four category. Um, we also looked at climate finance and we looked at the Green Climate Fund, um, which is sort of a vertical fund for funding. It's a series of grants to countries. Countries have to apply to them uh, to do climate action, uh, either on the mitigation or ad adaptation side. And we looked at um, the last, we looked at 2022. We did it for other years too, but I just want to, and they're all pretty much like this, but I wanted to just present you with one year of data keep it simple. And again, you can see of the more than a billion uh, allocated of grants in 2022, uh, very, you know, 76 million of the, of the, plus, of the billion plus uh, go to, um, go to uh, actions that are, have, that have explicitly and deliberately and intentionally incorporated typically nutritious food. When I say nutrition, it's typically around food. Not, not, not so much around health systems. So again, the potential is huge. And we've, we've reached out to the Green Climate Fund and we're trying to work with them. It's not easy, um, but we're trying to work with them to help them shape their grant calls, to shape their grant uh, evaluations and, and to build in KPIs, give advice for KPIs for the grants they make so that there's more of a uh, a, a willingness or more of a signal from the IFI, from the Green, Green Climate Fund to countries that um, we welcome applications in this uh, nutritious food space. Same with overall ODI, uh, very little of it uh, is going to uh, to nutrition. This is slight. This is slightly different because this is uh, one. That one percent is uh, the basic nutrition code, which is, which covers essentially health system interventions. We haven't been able to do this for a broader definition of nutrition yet, but we will get to it. And just last week, the World Bank reached out to us at ICANN and said, we'd really like to work with you a lot more on the climate and nutrition space. Those of you who've seen their latest nutrition investment plan uh, work that um, I think Tom was mentioning coming out of Mira Shakar's shop, there's a, there's a reference to ICANN and, and they said they, that climate and nutrition chapter was deeply inspired by ICANN and they want to do some more work with us at the country level and the subnational level. So that's really exciting. The private sector is also lagging uh, really in integrating climate nutrition. I was really surprised at this. Now this is the World Benchmarking Alliance data. The World Benchmarking Alliance looks at 350 big agri-food companies and it, it, it ranks them and it's, it's, a, it's not a it's not a, a particularly, and this isn't being critical of the, of the World Benchmarking Alliance, it's not a particularly uh, strongly validated or, or um, yeah, validated assessment. It's, 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 looking up, it's looking at what the, com the companies choose to put into the public domain, and then based on what they choose to put in the public domain, assessing um, are they, uh, how well do they score on nutrition and how well do they score on climate it's actually sustainability but it's essentially climate and so we said well let's see how many companies do well on both of those dimensions so that's that's us being um uh, sort of innovating on the hoof and um i was really surprised that none of the countries uh, do score well on both of those criteria um the, the companies do better on sustainability because it's more directly linked to their bottom line than nutrition but I was surprised that the ones that do well on nutrition tend not to be the ones who do well on sustainability. So again, this is now an opportunity to go to the companies that scored maybe in the level three area. So 35, 10% of the 350, 35 companies scored in the level three. We could go to them and say, how do you, do you want to get to level four? How can we help you get to level four? And getting to level four means more resources for nutrition as well as more for sustainability. We could go to the level ones and say, how do you want to, how do you get to level two as well? But these, these, these insights are giving us actionable actions, actionable opportunities to change the dynamic. And, you know, we know what to do. It's, it's not like we don't know what to do. If we find a country that says, yeah, we'd like to move from level three to level four in this domain, or we'd, we'd like, to, or a company that says we'd like to go from level two to level three, or a fund like the Green Climate Fund that says we'd like to go from level two to level three, we know what to do. You know, the, the, uh, these, you know all about these interventions. They're all good for climate and they're good for nutrition. 
for various reasons. So I'm not going to go into that, but that, that, that's that's a pretty standard list. So it's not like we don't have solutions. We have solutions, but we don't know how to uh, engineer opportunities. And I think this ICANN piece of work can really help that. And so the final the final one is businesses. Um, at the start of the N4G process, one of the people on the independent expert group, this is about six months ago or nine months ago, said, we need to get the private sector to, to fund more nutrition programs. And I said, actually, that's completely wrong. They're never going to fund a nutrition program. Why would they fund a nutrition program? Maybe in their corporate sustainable, their CSR stuff, they would do it. But we need to find ways in which it makes sense for them and their business model to do nutrition. Why does it, how do, how do we get it to make sense? So um, those of those nutritionists who work in the food system who say, we don't want to work with the private sector, my response to you is get over yourselves. Uh, the private sector is the food system. So if you don't engage, you're going to be fiddling at the margins. Engagement doesn't mean endorsement. Remember that. It's very, very important distinction. We just don't, again, we don't work with any, any old business. We put them through a very rigorous uh, protocol. But you have to engage because they're everywhere in the food system. You know, we, we tend to, when we, nutritionists tend to think of the private sector as big food companies, but they're transporters, they're warehouses, they're refrigeration companies, they're transport companies, they're market agencies, they're banking and financing agencies, they're credit loans, they're, they're everywhere. We have to engage with the private sector. Right, this is what we again how we again think about the private sector. What do we want the private sector to do? We want the private sector to supply more nutritious foods in the market place. We want them to provide more nutritious food in the workforce and the workplace. We want them to provide more nutritious foods to the public sector programs, like schools, like uh, social protection programs. And we want them to, to supply less unhealthy foods in the marketplace. How do we incent? It's all about incentivizing them. And we need to use carrots and sticks, right? Not just, not just sticks. We need carrots as well. So to supply more nutritious foods in the marketplace as the green box, we need to support small and medium enterprises that are already supplying nutritious foods. We work with loads and loads of SMEs uh, in Africa and Asia that are producing nutritious foods. And they say, we're, we're producing nutritious foods not because we care that much about nutrition, just because it's a good business model for us. We want, there's a demand for vegetables and fruits and we want, to, we want to meet that demand. There's a demand for fish and we want to meet that demand. We need to support those companies to help them grow and shape their ecosystem. More importantly, we, perhaps we have, to, we have to support those SMEs in those countries to, to have a voice, to say to the government, Government, if you do X, Y, and Z, it'll make it even easier for us in the SME sector to produce and supply uh, pulses, vegetables, fruits, eggs, dairy, fish. In the orange box, uh, I already gave you, uh, well, I, I was talking about it earlier today, uh, we need to support employers in the private sector and in the public sector to make foods served to their workforce healthier to improve worker productivity, loyalty, reduce turnover. It was, I was, last week I was in Ethiopia. I met with a new minister of health, who's fantastic, by the way. Um, Mektes, I can't remember her last name. Mektes is her first name, fantastic. And um, I was telling her about uh, this garment factory program that we run. And she said, well, there's 400,000 workers in the public sector for health. Why can't we do something with them? Maybe there's a one in a hundred chance something will happen along that, but we will definitely pursue that. But it makes sense. It makes sense to employers because it's 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 a way of uh, differentiating themselves from other employers. They get loyalty. They get they get they get all, all sorts of benefits that that accumulate in their bottom line. Um, supplying more nutritious foods to the public sector. We're doing a lot of work with schools and school feeding programs. School feeding programs are very high up on the agenda great opportunity to get nutritious foods into, into the diets at very, very minimal extra cost, if any. Um, and again, uh, good for social protection. We talked about social protection. It's difficult to get social protection. It, it's difficult to get nutrition into social protection around the behavior change side, because it's one more complication. But maybe there's a way of linking 
we shouldn't give up on that, but maybe there's a way of linking to uh, local production to supply uh, more, more nutritious foods for people who now have a little bit more income to spend. And then, of course, we need, we need to get, um, we need to curb the bad. We need to supply less unhealthy food. And we need fiscal rules to disincentivize high salt, sugar, and trans fats. Perhaps no one's really talked much about value-added tax, uh, sales tax. Um, it's being introduced more and more into more and more countries. Is there a way of using that to differentiate between foods that are healthy and not healthy? I don't know, but it's something we should be looking into. Work with youth. Youth are very, very vocal about anti-junk food campaigns, and uh, we need to develop better, better metrics around food healthiness. Too often, the big food companies say our food's pretty healthy, but they won't, they won't uh, subject it to public analysis. And I, I'll give you, we, we, we do a lot of work in all these different areas. This is the factory I was in last week, and uh, I just, I took a like a five-second clip of it because I, I thought it was so interesting. It was so huge. Look how huge it is. It's absolutely huge. It's light. It's airy. It's temperature controlled. The working conditions are decent. Uh, it employs 9,000 workers. 90% of them are women, 18 to 30 years old. We inspired and supported them to provide healthier canteen food at breakfast and lunch. And there are dozens and dozens and dozens of these garment factories all over Ethiopia. And it's just that, I mean, you can see how big it is. It's absolutely. I, I couldn't believe it, actually, when I saw it. So my conclusions in the current context, and I would say in any context, actually, we need to uh, work with IFIs to help them do better on nutrition, convince them that it's in their interests, all the pressure they're getting to be more development orientated, to be nimbler, to really advance SDGs and show they're, they're human-centered. Um, they're in that space. We should push on that door. Uh, work with the climate champions. The climate champions are again being slowly dragged into the food space. You know, if you look at if you look at COP twenty six, uh, there was a sign on. There was a door with a sign over it that said um, food. COP twenty seven, that door with a sign over it that said food was kicked open. COP twenty eight, people walked through that door and started to say, well, how can we decorate this room? And I hope COP twenty nine and COP thirty will keep pushing, pushing. And we have to be ready with the solutions for those climate champions. They're, they're fixated at the moment on transport and energy, but eventually they will get to food because it's 33% 30, 30, of emission. They will get there eventually. We have to be ready. And then finally, the private sector. We have to find ways to improve nutrition outcomes that also improve business performance. I think there are lots of opportunities. And to be frank, the only way we see them at gain is we employ people who have been in the private sector, so they understand the opportunities. They also understand the risks, and we, ha and we have to talk to them and engage with them to understand which ones are scoundrels and which ones are really trying to do the right thing. We need to get out of our comfort zones and we need to innovate. Thank you. We'll up to questions now, and uh, you know I think you've you've given us a, a lot of food for thought, and hopefully pushed us a little bit out of our comfort zones. Um, are there any countries that you think are making seriously good strides uh, in terms of linking nutrition and climate, or with their uh, food systems approach, starting to build? for healthier diets? Well, um, I, I only really know the 12 countries well that the GAIN has offices in, because yeah. that's, that's how we focus our work. And um, I think Bangladesh is absolutely extraordinary in this regard. If you look at their ICANN scores, I should have put the scores for all of our countries up there. They are way ahead of all the other countries. They have found ways, they have to, right? Climate's really important for them. It's a big Delta country. They're very vulnerable to climate change. They have to. They have really integrated climate and nutrition in all of their strategies. They're trying. To, they're building it into their finance, into their grants to IFAD, their grant requests to IFAD. Uh, it's it's extraordinary. So yeah, I mean, I was in Ethiopia last week, as I said, and they're trying, but uh, they're finding uh, multi-sector, multi. They're finding uh, not so much multi-stakeholder. It's the multi-sectoral stuff that's finding very hard coordinating 
15 ministries. I said, to, I said, you know, with all due respect, try to coordinate the, the five or six that are really key and then the rest will follow. We'll fall in. Okay, opening up now if, for questions. Yes. And just to ask, say your name as well and your affiliation. Thanks very much, Judith Randall from Public Good. Thank you very much, Lawrence. If only we lived in a rational world then. <laughs> uh, yes, if only. Um, but there are pockets of rationality. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. So just, just thinking about um, the comfort zone slide. We're very comfortable in the bit that says we get, you know, so many dollars return for every dollar we invest in nutrition. But we're not very comfortable or we don't really engage enough for a country to borrow or an IFI to lend for nutrition because it's not seen as, as that, that, that argument, um, well researched though it may be on the rates of return, doesn't have the traction when you're actually thinking about whether you're going to take the risk. So I'm interested in, in more discussion about how we can move that along. In relation to that and moving out of the comfort zone, I think it's remarkable how little attention we pay to men and nutrition. Mm. We have hardly any data at all on men and nutrition because the databases we rely on are reproductive health databases, essentially. And how many men depend on their physical labor for their and their household's survival? And I'm wondering, as part of the move to get nutrition more discussed in economic discussions, whether that's something that we need to, to think about much more. And I wonder also if there's another lesson from the, the gender experience. People don't lend for or borrow to do gender, but they may well not lend or not borrow if gender isn't part of the um, KPIs, if it isn't part, part of the visibility around what they're lending for. And is that analogous to, to nutrition? Is that what we need to find a way of building in much more systematically so that there's a vehicle for looking at nutrition outcomes in relation to the lending, even if you're not lending for nutrition? Yes, great questions, Judith. Um, I, I, we, I think we, that, that 16 to 1 ratio where you invest in an under 2 and, and the, the under 2 at the median uh, will learn more in school, generate more income in the labor market. That's a useful ratio, but I think there are other ratios and we've, we've been developing them through our, because we need them for our work. And so a couple that I think are really interesting is uh, workforce nutrition. We developed uh, a ratio, we did a literature review that said there's a one to six ratio. If you invest $1 of your employer's money in a workforce nutrition program, you'll get $6 back. So that's quite interesting. So that's quite immediate, quite relevant. And then we, we just commissioned someone from MSU to do, Michigan State University, to do a review of literature around if you, in the context of the Sun Business Network, if you invest a dollar in um, supporting an SME, what, what, how many dollars do you get back from doing that if, in, in the next three years? And there's a wide range of benefit cost ratios uh, at what, from one to two, so one dollar public, two dollar private, all the way up to 12, I think. And it depends on the type of support you give, whether it's technical, business, or financial support. So I think those kind of, we need to socialize those, those kind of ratios a bit more. And I look to something like the Global Nutrition Report to, to do that, that we've both been involved in over the years. I'd like to see it do more of that kind of thing. I think gender is a fantastic opportunity as well. Thanks to the government of Canada and others, it's gotten a much more political heft now than it has before. Women, uh, women Deliver is very powerful. Uh, movement, I would say it's more powerful than Sun at the moment, and uh, you see a lot of uh, finance finance instruments are gender focused. In fact, our our finance team at Gain is looking at the or I can't remember what it's called now. I think it's called the X two or the X ten two X two X initiative, and uh, we're looking at how to get nutrition into that two X initiative. And then um, I think it's I think your point about men is interesting. Um, because, like it or not, well, I don't like it, but men tend to be more pulling the strings of power in, in most places. And um, I think they're pretty ob oblivious to their own nutrition status. And uh, the one, one, another initiative that we've uh, been running now with the Gallup World Poll, 
is to collect data on diets of men and women, rural and urban. Uh, we've done this for the last three years now, I think, with Gallup World Pulse. We've got data at the national level for 50 or 60 countries uh, on men's and women's diet. Diet diversity is the, is the metric. But we've also, we've also collected in, information. Uh, it's not so much on how much they eat, but what type of diversity do they eat. We've also got, we've also got information on um, uh, consumption of soft drinks, uh, foods that protect against NCDs, foods that promote um, diet-related chronic disease. So that's called the Global Diet Quality Initiative, and it's uh, it's out of Harvard, Gallup, and Gain, I think. So that so I think again we're trying to, yeah, we're trying to get these these tools, these metrics, into use. One of the struggles we have again is, uh, well, it's not a struggle. It's get them into use in the twelve countries we work in, but we feel like that that other countries should be using them, you know. And how do we how do we do that? So we're, we're working on that. Question in so online. I'll try to get my answer shorter. <laughs> a question coming in online about the role that NGOs can play in as of supporting nutrition, particularly NGOs that are active on the ground with communities. Well, you know, I think I mean NGOs and Gain is an NGO that's active on the ground. So you're you're talking to the kindred spirit. We've got 430 staff and 330 are based in Africa and Asia. They're, they're and they're all Africans and Asians. So they're, they're actually delivering programs, doing policy work, and doing a bit of research work on the ground. I think, um, to be honest, I think NGOs spend a bit too much time trying to influence parents and not enough time trying to influence people who are pulling the levers of power. So I'd like to see them spend more time influencing business leaders and government leaders and uh, municipal municipality leaders and uh, and UN and, and you know there's there's a whole, when we talk about behavior change and nutrition we tend to think of parents but behavior change and nutrition applies to everyone who makes decisions about nutrition so that would be my advice um can I ask you I suppose linked to that uh, particularly for NGOs working in agricultural development um you know how could we better leverage the impact of agricultural development programs on nutrition? I reframe them around food systems. Food systems will open up a whole big space. Uh, it will force the ag folks to uh, care about what happens beyond the farm gate. And uh, if they don't have markets for people to buy their food, the farmers' foods, then the farmers will really suffer. So the transaction costs between farm gate and market are way too high. Lots of people seeking rent, uh, lots of bad infrastructure, lots of bad finance. Focus on that space, getting connecting the farmers to the markets. And uh, then I think that opens up lots of space for nutrition. Because okay. between farm and market, a lot of nutrition drops out of the value chain. But you can add a lot of nutrition or pres preserve the nutrition in the value chain. So I think there are lots of opportunities there. An interesting question here from Maud, who's the country director for concern in the Central African Republic. And it's about uh, governments not wanting to publicly acknowledge the nutrition problems that they face. Um, and in the face of diminishing resources, donors push back on funding critical malnutrition prevention activities. What are the options? I think, I think, don I think governments are, are embarrassed about the emergency situations. Uh, but the chronic situations, I find them less, well, they should be more concerned about it, but they're not. Um, so I, I I, don't know. I think you always have to speak truth to power, as inconvenient as that can be. Um, but it's easier said than done, because if you get kick, kicked out of a country for saying something, that's probably counterproductive. So I think you just got to be really clever. You've got to deliver the hard messages behind closed doors and in private. And um, I think... That we have to do that as professionals. And I, I may not be answering the question. No, but I think that idea of strategize from where you are, pushing out of the zone and looking at what's possible and where there are doors that are open to push. Another question in here is from Heather, who's an I IEA researcher, about could replicating indigenous people's food systems, which are based on respecting the ecosystem and ensuring replenishment of biodiversity, improve global nutrition? I, I think it's a good question. I think there's certainly um, 
the, th the problem I have with the uh, agroecology community is not the 13 principles are brilliant that any of you know about agroecology, the 13 principles that underlie it, circularity, diversity, regeneration. These are, these are great principles, but there's a certain subset of the agroecology community that's almost religious about this. And they say, if you don't do all 13 at the same time, it's not agroecology. And for, I'm a pragmatist. To me, that doesn't make any sense. If I can move from three of those practices to six, I'm happy because the, the direction of travel is in that direction. Now, whether that improves nutrition is a really interesting question. Um, in, in theory, it could because more diverse food systems, certainly where markets are not working perfectly and they never work perfectly anywhere, um, you should, what you produce, if there's a diversity of what you produce, it should be reflected in a diversity of consumption. And I think it's, it's, certainly, it's certainly clear that it's better for the environment. Whether it's better for nutrition, I think it can be, but it doesn't, it's not automatic. Yeah, but I think there's, and you mentioned earlier as well about resilience, you know, local resilience mm. is probably where we need to look at it. It has Absolutely. to be based on a diversity. Absolutely. Yes, Absolutely. It's, it's, it's a diversity that's national and international. Yeah. It can't just be national. Yeah. Tara. Hi, my name is Tara. I'm one of the researchers here. I suppose I was wondering if you think westernization in a way, um, affects nutrition. And the reason I ask is, I grew up in Slovenia, and there wasn't a McDonald's in sight at the time. Um, so you had no choice but to eat salad and your neighbor's cow. Whereas now, <laughs> I think children in Slovenia eat a lot worse because of the emergence of all these, you know, fast food places and so on. Definitely, it's definitely, it's 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 horrific, actually. Um... We had two two sort of examples from our programs. One in in Kenya, we we actually we've actually launched a food culture alliance in um, in Indonesia, Kenya, and I, I forgot the third country. I think it's Mozambique. And we're trying as part of the Nourishing Food Pro Pathways program. We're trying to understand, and Paul, I think Paul was present when we talked about this about a month ago. We're trying to uh, unlock the codes to culture, the keys to culture, food culture. And it sounds very ambitious, but the, the work so far has, uh, in, in Kenya, the, the predominant code, the predominant key to the food culture is westernization. That's what everyone aspires to. But in Indonesia, it's, it's, um, it's um, abundance is the key. So abundance means uh, it's, in Indonesia, it's, you, know, you have to show you have lots of food because it's good for your neighbors, it's good for your family, it's, it's a sign of your standing in a community. So it's not westernization. So I think the first, the first thing is to figure out what is the key to that food culture and that every, every food culture will have different keys and, and more than one. What's the predominant key, which can be done. And then the second thing is to come up with demand creation uh, approaches that are really blending public sector and private sector approaches private sector is brilliant at getting you to consume things you don't want to consume and probably shouldn't consume. Public sector is pretty hopeless at getting you to, to do things you should be doing. They'll say, this food is good for you, therefore you should eat it. If you've got a, an adolescent in the household, you know that that will uh, simulate lots of eye rolling and size. Um, <laughs> so you have to try and do both. So we try in Indonesia, we have these, uh, you know, those big bags of cheese puffs you can, mm -hmm. you can get pretty much outside any school or any community health center for that manner. manner. Um, they're very cheap. They're very tasty. They're very, uh, they look great, packaged nicely. Uh, in the community health centers in Indonesia, we will buy a packet of those. And then and with a, a, a group of 20 or 30 parents sitting in a circle, we'll dissolve one of those cheese puffs in a glass of water. And as you do it, you can see stuff coming off it and then an oil slick forms in the water. And you pass that cup around to the parents and you can see an emotional response, a revulsion to that. And you have to use emotion, I think, to get people to think about what they're eating. And that's what the private sector does so well. It does it through aspiration, through humor, through shock value. But we need to become better at it in the, uh, in the public health realm shifting food diet space. So I think you, you can combat westernization, um, 
but it has to be through a, 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 a whole set of approaches and governments have to be brave. They have to be brave. They, they can't just resort to taxes, they have to resort to incentives as well. It's difficult for, business, for developing country governments because businesses are big employers, they're big generators of tax. So it's not easy to say, you know, kill these companies that are producing these foods. But um, you, have to, you, have to, you have to begin. Um, I'm going back to a question from Maud, and I think I hadn't fully read the whole question. Um, least developed countries carry maybe the largest burden of malnutrition, and yet the IFIs, the climate funds, and the private sector are very shy on their investments in these countries. Um, so what are the options within the poorest countries where it's very hard to get that investment going? Well, I think I mean, my colleague Steve knows as much about this, if not more than I do, but I think, um, I think it's, 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 it's easy for the IFIs to say that. It's easy for them to say, well, there aren't the opportunities in the lowest income countries, but there are. We work in some of the lowest income countries and there are, there are pockets of investment and innovation. You just have to find them. But they're not easy to find. I will, I will agree to that. So you have to work a bit harder. But this is a great example of where public sector can come in and de-risk this space a little bit for the for the IFIs, when the IFIs are public sector, but you know what I mean. Yeah. Uh, they, they, can, they can come in with a little bit of aid money and de-risk this space. Find find a, a pipeline of 100 companies in this country, that in a country X, that can really advance uh, something uh, that addresses climate and nutrition at the same time. You know, find, find those companies. We can do that. I suppose you're, what you're really saying is there are spaces for innovation and sometimes actually uh, not having too much money may make us a little bit more creative and more innovative. Necessity is. Is the mother of, yes. Um, any last question before we bring things to a close? I'd like to thank our online audience first and for the questions coming in from there. And I'd like to ask all of you to join me in saying a big thank you to Lawrence.